Hello, my name is Leah and I'm a ranger here at Voyagers National Park. And I'm really excited to talk to you today about oral histories because one of the things that I've loved so much about my time in the Park Service is getting to learn more about history of these spaces and of our nation and our continent. And this park has so many rich layers of history all stuck in this peninsula of this map I have behind me. Um, so since we are going to talk a lot today about memory and about history, I want to start by asking you to take a few moments to focus in on one specific memory. So I want you to think about a time that you went to a new place, a place you were really excited to visit. I just want you to really try to re-enter that moment. So think about where you were going, but also how it felt to be going there, how you felt inside, and also what it, what it looked like and what it sounded like and even what it smelled like. Really try to be in that space. If you're with someone else, feel free to pause the video and actually talk a little bit about that memory, see if new details come up as you speak about it. And just, if you're alone, feel free to, you know, sit back in your chair and close your eyes for a second and, and try to be in that moment. So what I'm going to do for you now is I'm going to play for you an oral history, a set of memories from a woman named Lydia Tori, who called this region home for many years. She actually had immigrated from Finland, but ended up living on Kubel Island. So on this map, we see Kubel Island right here. It's not that far from when Namakin and Kabatogama Lakes, two of the four main lakes in the park, join up. So she came to Kubel Island to meet a man named Emil a commercial fisherman with whom she had been corresponding for a year at this stage. And I'll let her take it from there, but as she talks, I'll also show you a picture so you will see Lydia Tori in her later years. She's sitting in a bright red sweater. Um, there are a couple dogs sort of jumping on her, and you can see behind her the lake and the trees that are so distinctive to so much of Voyagers. So with that, I'll turn it over to Lydia. I've been part of the country for 48 years now. And then, uh, and uh, I met my uh, fisherman. At uh, some point, lady knew him, and then uh, she told me that uh, write just a little uh, note with that uh, old old man. I did, of course, he's not old, but anyway, uh, write some some kind of a little note for him, and then I did. And then, uh, and that's the reason I've been here. You know, I was corresponded for a year before I see him even. And then he asked me if I come to see this part of the country. I said, yes, I like the country. And I like that kind of a lot of water and a lot of rock and a lot of everything. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he met me down the Ray Middle, uh, Ray Dibble. And then, uh, <clears throat> and then uh, he brought me uh, to see this part of the country. And I kind of like this, book, this part of the country. And boy, that's uh, I like this because this uh, looks almost like my old country in our country. There's so many islands, so many waters, so much rock and everything else. And that's a mine. That's a mine. Uh, uh, so I like very much this part of the country. And then, then we married. And then he asked me if I be his uh, wife or so. And then I said, yes, yeah, I guess I like it because uh, I have no anybody else. <laughs> Okay, so as I said, that was an oral history from Lydia Tori. And just to quickly rewind a little bit and review what an oral history is, you could probably guess it from the name, it's a spoken history. So this is something that many cultures have done for a long time, whether it's through oral literatures, traditions, traditions of storytelling, to probably what you do in your own family of telling memories and sharing them maybe around a dinner table or something like that. But an oral history is also actually gets a little more specific. It's a certain type of historical source. So it kind of means two things. So one, oral history can be the process of collecting oral histories. So sort of formally sitting down with someone, intentionally recording their memories, having a set of questions that you're running through to talk with them about. And then an oral history is also the thing that results from that. So it's usually a recording or always a recording. There's often a transcript that goes with it as well. And so that becomes your historical source, oral histories. And we're really lucky here at Voyagers that there was a big project done in the 1970s and early 1980s for the most part. So not that long after we became a park, which was going to happen in the early 1970s, they um, had someone named Mary Lou Pearson who went around and she talked to people. She talked to people who had or were still living in this space of the park. She talked to people who had worked in this park for many years. So 
loggers and commercial fishermen. She talked to residents of International Falls. She talked to some of the folks who were really involved in the creation of the park and saved them all. And so we have these in our library. There's over a hundred of them. They definitely are going to be focused on people who are later on in their years in many cases. So people who were born in the late 1800s and early 1900s and have long memories of this place. So that means they're a super cool source of facts, of information about the, of the park. Uh, we can learn about, you know, what daily life was like in a logging camp. We can learn how many fish Harry Ovison caught on a given day. Um, and that makes them a really cool source. They talk to people who had really technical knowledge as well. Um, so we can learn very specific things. But they are still memories. And I think that's one of the things about oral histories. I love them. And they're a really complicated type of historical source. And that's for a couple of reasons. And I, I think you can probably pretty quickly think of them if I ask you, why do you think using memories as a historical source is risky? And I think a pretty quick answer that I hear a lot when I ask that question is going to be that it's not perfect. We all skew our memories. Um, I've talked to kids and been like, do you remember something? Or is it just from having looked at the picture and suddenly you're not sure anymore? And it, it gets faded over time. So as I said, some of these people are talking about things that happened 40, 50 years ago. So if I asked you what you ate for breakfast yesterday, I think you've got it down. If I asked you what you ate for breakfast even two years ago, you might struggle a little bit more. You might be able to tell me something general, but not get too specific. So of course, we're going to have memories that are just imperfect, that are skewed. There's another reason that memories are a little risky, and that's because we each have our own perspectives. Right? So think back to that memory you had at the beginning about the time that you were excited to go somewhere. And if you were with someone else, do you think they have the same set of memories about that visit, about that new place? Or do you think maybe they pulled different things from the day or they might have, honestly, it might not even have stuck in their head that much at all if perhaps that was the 35th time that they had been to that place. And so memories also are going to be filtered through all of these lenses that we bring to the world. And that's both sort of the danger of using memories as a historical source and the incredible advantage of using memories as a type of historical source. Because even if some of the facts might be a little skewed, and part of the reason I talk about this before we listen to them is because I do think it's important to remember if you've, say, grown up in this area or know this space really well, you might hear things that you think sound wrong or incorrect or don't match your own family's stories. And that's going to be because of this perspective piece that these people are talking not just about what they saw as happening, but their perspective on it. So maybe they talk about someone that your family member knew really well, and they don't, they've just heard gossip about. But then having those perspectives, thinking about those lenses is again, as I was saying, part of where that value lies. Because it doesn't just tell us what might have happened, but how that particular person felt about what was happening, what that particular person noticed. And through doing that, we can learn so much about the people who have decided to call this place home, who have fell in love with this pretty incredible place that is now a national park. And so as we listen to these stories, as we listen to stories from the park, from people who lived here for many years in a lot of cases, I want you to think about what perspectives they might be bringing to the table, what lenses they're looking through. For example, a lens that I look through is I'm not from here at all. I grew up in Tennessee. So when I first came here and I looked at the lakes, I was filtering it through this idea of the lens of what Tennessee lakes look like and how these were different or similar. And over time, I've come to know them as their own lakes. And so what are the perspectives that people bring? How do you think their perspectives might even be changing as they think through these memories? And how, what types of change are they noticing? So with that, I will stop talking and get back to the people you are here to hear, um, starting again with Lydia Torrey, who we already heard from once. So as I mentioned, she came here to meet Emil, who was a commercial fisherman. She was born in Finland in 1891 and immigrated when she was quite, when she was young, to New York. And from there, she made her way out to Minnesota. So after years of marriage to Emil, they, they lived there for many years. She helped with some of the ice collecting. She started a garden. But he did eventually actually drown. He was out on a, on a trip to deliver fish to Gappa Landing, which is not all that far from where I'm standing right now at Cabotokama Lake Visitor Center, and he never came back. By that point, she had lived there for almost 20 years and she decided to stay. So at the age of 63, she started building her own life out on Kuba Island, and lived there for another 20 years, hunting, fishing, 
gardening, crocheting, and playing music. So we actually have a recording of that music, so that's what I'm going to play for you now, is Lydia Tori talking about how she got her one-string harp and playing a little segment of it, a little bit of music. And the picture I'll show is going to be, unsurprisingly, her with that harp. So here's a picture of her, it's black and white, she's wearing a kerchief, she's kind of middle age -ish. She's going to be holding sort of a box-like harp with one string on it. That's play the organ in the old country? No, no, I all? never played before. You didn't? Well, just uh, play, play some that, uh, by ear, you know. Mm -hmm. I didn't know any of those tunes or anything. And then, and what, what year would that have been? Oh, I don't know, just so many years ago. I was still living, I think it's about 20 years or more. And that you know, year they had really good ice? 30 years, maybe? 25 years, I guess, or more. I'm not really sure, but something like. And then, <coughs> and then they bought that from the house, and, and we live in that old house then. And then I used to still try to do some little this and that, and, and then, uh, then he make this, uh, this one string harp, and I used to, I like that one string harp more than I like this. Yeah, okay, we're going to walk over here and look at the harp now that she's talking about. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Tori is now going to play uh, a couple of tunes on the harp that her uh, husband made for her. So the next person we'll hear from is someone who actually lived not that far from Lydia Tori and also ended up living alone on one of the islands in Namekin Lake for many, many years. And his name is going to be I.W. Stevens, Ingvald Walter Stevens. So he's also going to have immigrated. He came from Norway. He was born there in 1885, came to the U.S. as a young man, and ended up working in Hibbing, Minnesota, as a shoe salesman. But he had health problems, and so he started looking for a different place to be, a different thing to do. And he found his way out to this region and decided to buy and run a resort. So he starts his resort, Pine Cove Resort, on this island right here. So if you look at the map, you can see it's not actually that far from where Lydia was tor Tori was living on Kubel Island. She actually mentions him a little bit in her oral histories as not being kind of a hermit. So he moves over here. He has his first guest come in 1937. And after about 20 years, he decides he's had enough of having the guests come over. He decides to retire, and he decides that he's going to stay because he still does love the island that he's living on. Um, so this happens in 1959. He stops the resort business, but he actually remains there for nearly 20 more years until the age of 94. So he's in this first clip, he's going to talk a little bit about that transition to retirement, about why he decided to stay and what it was like once he had no longer was running the resort. And as he does, I'll show a picture from much later. So this is actually going to be a couple years after he was interviewed in 1976. So at this point, he is going to be, you know, in his 90s. But you can see that he is standing up. There's a log cabin behind him. He has his ball cap on. He's holding a stick and he's clearly still ready for work fortunate in getting this place with a, a huge uh, native virgin pines and everybody tells me it's a beautiful spot and they don't need to because uh, I live here and I know it is if it, uh, if it wasn't as beautiful as it is I wouldn't have spent 44 years here the only trouble with me I worked myself to death during the time I operated as a sort I even washed all the laundry by hand as I had no electric power. And I had to carry the water in pails up to the house, heat it on the wood stove, and uh, do the washing there. Then my people were brought in, as I probably said before, 16 miles for Gappa's Landing. And finally, it got to be too much for me. So at the end of the season, 59, I give up the resort business. Well, uh, some people may think it's wonderful to uh, retire, but in my uh, way, it, I retired to more work. I have two gardens and a huge yard, two docks, and several boats, and everything has to be done the hard way. This spring, with lack of rain, I had to ca carry water in pails to 
my main garden across the bay, and, and there are a small home garden, because the lake was so low that I couldn't use my irrigation pump. Finally, discussed, I dragged the pump down to the lake shore <laughs> and set it up. So now things are going pretty good. Of course, living alone and doing all this work actually comes with a lot of risk. And so in this next clip, Stevens is going to talk a little bit about an accident he ended up having in the ice house. But before he does, he also is going to talk about blueberries and fish and harvesting. And so as he talks, I'm going to show a picture of a much younger Steve. That's one of the names he went by. Um, and he's going to be on a blanket outdoors, wiping a can um, that he's clearly just canned, maybe with blueberry jam or something else. And there's going to be other cans in front of him. The blueberries, they seem to grow wild. And here, the first summer I was up here, as I said before, I was had, had surgery for ulcers and had hemorrhages, stomach hemorrhages and so on. So I rolled out in the blueberry patch most of the day and I canned Oh, 165 quarts of blueberries that summer. But blueberries now, like everything else, seem to have disappeared. Talk about fishing. You could go out on the lake any time, sunny or cloudy, calm or windy, rainy or dry, and get your uh, limit of walleyes. But that too has disappeared. Now the boats uh, on the lake are very numerous and the poor fish gets it in the neck. I had a narrow escape uh, once in the ice house. I had a, third, a long iron chisel weighing over 13 pounds and it was hanging up on the wall and I had just cut a cake uh, I used for the ice box, and I didn't stop to think of anything. I was down on my knees, and, and uh, by putting uh, the ice on the ice chute, I must have jarred the, the wall, and this chisel came down and hit me in the back, and um, I could feel blood mm. running into my boots. I didn't know what in the world to think about it. I, I was tough enough to uh, wash the ice and put it in the ice, ice box, and then I undressed and checked. And about half an inch from my spine in the middle of my back, lower part, was a big gash, and the blood was just spurting out. Well, I had quite a time stopping the blood, but I did finally get it done. Next morning, some friends came over from Ash River and they found blood all over my house. And one of the men says, where's the mop, Steve? And I said, over there. So they cleaned up the house and, and they helped me put the motor on the boat and I drove it to a river and had a chance to drive to Hibbing with some friends and I was in the hospital that night. Well, I was back home in about a week. You can't kill the old Viking. <laughs> So now that we've listened to a couple people, I, I want to pause for a second and, and encourage you to think a little bit about what you noticed in these clips. So these are excerpts from much longer interviews. Of course, I'm not able to play everything that they said. But in the small snippets that we've heard, what has stood out to you? What has surprised you? And what perspectives do you think people might have been bringing? How has his life shaped these memories? I know one of the things that really stands out to me about both the interview with Lydia Torrey and the oral history of I.W. Stevens is there's a really strong sense of community in both of them. So even though both, both of them lived alone, clearly were very happy in their own spaces. You can notice, for example, Steve talking about the friends that came and found him. In other sections of Lydia Torrey's interview, she talks about the people who passed by her place as well, that even out there in places that might have felt very remote or seemed very remote to us, especially when we think about what they'd be like in the winter when there's three feet of ice on that lake. But they had communities of people that came around, that stopped by, and that took care of each other and took care of them. And you actually can see a little bit of I.W. Stevens' excitement about that in his journal as well. So I.W. Stevens also did keep a journal, and I think it's kind of cool because we do have the entry from the date that he gave this oral history interview. 
and he's clearly very excited about it. He writes on June 24th, 1976, this was a memorable day. Joe Caillou, chief park ranger, brought a charming lady, Mrs. Pearson of International Falls, to interview me about my 44 year residence on Damakin Lake. The interview went okay, in spite of the fact that I had never spoken into a tape recorder before. So we get that from Stevens, and we get this sense of community that also means people often talk about each other in these oral histories, or that we learn stories about people from some of the people they met. Um, and Noble Trigg is a really good example of this, because Noble Trigg went everywhere. So he was a forester, he was born down in Cook, um, so not too far from there on a homestead, and he started working for the U.S. Forest Service in 1917. Worked for the Forest Service for a number of years in this area, when the Civilian Conservation Corps got started up in the 1930s and a number of camps were built in this area to clean up after logging, to do some other restoration work, Noble Trigg ran a lot of those things. He then ended up working for a private logging company um, as a logging superintendent um, down in Duluth, but he, he kept strong ties to this region. He spent a lot of his career up in here. And he actually gives this interview from a cabin that he maintained on Namakin Lake. So in that interview, they asked him, you know, who were the characters you met? You've been so many places throughout this lake. And he tells one story about a really unusual man by the name of Dutch Messenger. So Dutch Messenger is going to be the namesake of Old Dutch Bay. So on the map that we've been looking at, if you look over, we have Kubel Island up here. I.W. Stevens' um, area is going to be a little south and west of it. If you keep going southwest of one bay over, you end up getting toward Old Dutch Bay. So as he talks, um, that is a place you can now camp. So I'll show a picture of that campsite with sort of water and trees, and we'll listen to Noble Trigg talk a little bit about Dutch Messenger. The lake was uh, Dutch Messenger. He was a, originally a lumberjack and quite a rounder and a, and a fighter. He was uh, always looking for trouble, a good drinker when he had the opportunity, and. Uh, when he was under the influence, he was always looking for a fight. But they tell me that when he was working in the camp at Ash Lake uh, many, many years ago, he was tending the cattle that they had. They raised, had cattle there for to slaughter. And when he was feeding the cattle, all of the heads would want to get in the same feed box at the same time, and uh, they'd tip it over or something, and he'd his ire would come up and he would blast one of these in the head with his fist and knock it down. <laughs> he told me that he fought with Joe Lou, um, he told me that he fought with John Sullivan one time and he didn't come out too well in that <laughs> end, but he was quite a rough and tumble man. Came into Ray one night, uh, got off the train and he was drunk and he went over to the saloon and started some trouble there, and sure enough, it turned out to be a clean-out of the whole place. He he uh, cleaned out the whole saloon and was very, very rough about it. One man was sitting in a chair asleep, and he kicked him in the face real hard. <laughs> he was he was not a very much of a gentleman. He was drinking. And in 1932, he had a shack in what they call uh, Messenger Bay, which is just as you get into Mammican Lake. Um, one night he was, he and a fellow by the name of uh, Mike McGilvery were in his shack and doing some drinking. And, and apparently there was an argument, and Mike was killed by a 30 30 shot that night. Messenger was brought into court and uh, tried in Virginia for murder, and apparently they, they couldn't pin it on him that it was accidental or not, so he was let loose. So in a way, during the CC days when I had the camp in the bay or in the Narrows, he would come over every two or three days, like to borrow a little kerosene and maybe something else that would go in his pack sack, because he always had a pack sack. And, always a little bit hungry, but when he was sober, he was quite a gentleman. So I'm sad to say I actually cut that one off a, a moment too soon because he goes on to say that when sober, a uh, Dutch messenger talked just like a preacher. So another sort of nice character moment, an observation from Noble Trigg. Now Noble Trigg is also the source of a lot of 
sort of more serious stories about the area, including the 1936 fire. So this was a really large fire that swept through much of the Cabotoguma Peninsula, the big peninsula that marks sort of the center of the park, um, or a large percentage of the park's land. Um, and so in his, I'll play a little bit of him talking about a particular spur of the fire that he helped to go fight out near Cruiser Lake, um, which you can still hike to in the park today. Um, the follow-up of this, when the fire was then, we might call it cold, Alec Gerber arrived by boat and announced that another fire had broken out southwest of uh, Cruiser Lake, and then we had to go in there. This was not very good news. I selected 26 men. We started off the next morning and hiked into Cruiser Lake. And we could see this fire. It was a tremendous thing. It looked like an atomic bomb had exploded in the west. Uh, we uh, set up camp at, uh, on the north shore of Cruiser Lake where there was a set of camps owned by Mrs. Coleman. We, we suspected that the fire would reach us before too many hours because it was traveling at a fairly good rate. So we decided we'd try to build a fire line around this set of camps there and try to salvage the buildings. We had a, the cook's name, who was with his name was Tony Clark. <coughs> I told Con Tony to and cook a big stew because there was a camp range in there and there was plenty of firewood and and, and the buildings were open so he went in and he started to fire in one of the big ranges there and put this stew on and a big and a big kettle about a I'd say a 20 quart kettle or larger big cast iron kettle and he's making this stew had a whole ham in there and a lot of vegetables that we carried in the rest of us were out putting in this fire line and letting down the area with a fire pump. And uh, we had it, what I thought was pretty well under control. We started backfiring from this line and the fire that we had started had burnt back about a hundred yards. And all of a sudden we got a northwest gale and the main fire came down on us. And it went right over our fire line, right over the buildings and cleaned off everything. In the meantime, we had all run down and gotten the lake. In about 20 minutes or half an hour, the fire was long past gone and the buildings were smoldering. And I remember that stew kettle was sitting on top of that camp range was just steaming. <laughs> well the building, the building had burned away from it. <laughs> but the camp range was still standing out there in the field with this stew kettle on it. But that it boiled dry but then and away so as we've gone through these stories i think you can also sort of notice that we're we're capturing a lot of the different ways that people in the early 1900s were using this land so we've talked about forestry we've heard from someone who's married to a commercial fisherman there's of course going to be resort owners there's also there was a gold rush in the late 1800s there was homesteading that was taking place there were of course the ojibwe um, who call this area home for a number of years. We're going to continue to use the land and we'll talk about that more in a second as well. There's going to be, I think I already mentioned recreation, and then there's going to be one other big one in the 1930s, which is bootlegging. So as you might imagine, this was a great place to bootleg because the park is sort of defined by the Canadian border that runs right through Rainy Lake and Damican Lake and Sandpoint Lake. And so this was a great spot to bootleg. There were also folks called blind piggers. So bootlegging, you'd be bringing it over the border. Blind piggers were the people who were brewing stuff themselves during prohibition and selling that. So there's a lot of that happening near Kettle Falls area, um, as well as other islands spread throughout the park. But in terms of bootlegging, there were some legends in that. And so here is the story of Dusty Roads, which is going to be told by a man named Don Bowser. Now, one of the things we'll notice in the recording is that he mentions a picture and so that's the picture I'm going to show. Um, pictures are a really good thing to use when you're doing oral histories to sort of help jog people's memories. So it's sort of a sepia-toned sepia picture of an old plane and Bowser will describe it a little bit more over the course of his interview. Well, Dusty Rhodes was one of the first of the bush pilots to come into this area and uh, 
he made most of his money by flying over to the Canadian side and picking up whiskey and beer and flying it into the States. And as I look at this picture here, I see the name on the plane is Kingston and Rhodes. And of course, he had to call himself Dusty. That uh, seemed to be the thing to do in those days. But he was quite a pilot. I've seen him do a lot of things with that airplane that some of the pilots today wouldn't even attempt to do. And he carried bigger loads in a smaller plane than I've ever seen carried since. But what, what year was he flying around? Well, I saw him in 28, 29, 30, and 31. It was the years I seen him around here. Now, I don't know how many years he was here before that. And I noticed the side of his airplane has Spirit of St. Louis County on it. <laughs> <laughs> so he must have lived in the area quite a while. He, the last we heard of him, he was down in Mexico, and that apparently is where he died. Still trying to fly just over the edge of the law. So throughout this, I, I think I keep sort of talking about the way that these stories can tell us about people's perspectives. They can help us learn about people's relationship with this place. And I think in particular, oral histories can be a really useful way for tracking change. Partly, people will often talk about the changes that they've noticed. So for example, if you think back to I.W. Stevens talking about how there are fewer fish than there once were. But I also think it allows us to think about or notice ways that certain things have changed or stayed the same with our own experiences. So as you listen, you might have noticed either ways that people were using this space or the things that people found important that are similar to what you do or are very, very different from the ways that you might feel about voyagers or about this place. And I think another way that we can hear a little bit of that change is by listening to this last interview. So this is with an Ojibwe man named Peter Adams, who is a member of the Boys Ford Ojibwe Band. He grew up near Moose River, so sort of one bay east from Old Dutch Bay that we already looked at. If you follow that river down, that's going to be the Moose River. So he grew up in that area. He was born in 1910. Um, and over the course of his story, he shares memories of working for the logging companies, of visiting Kettle Falls and more. But in this particular memory, he talks about the ways that the Ojibwe at the time went through the seasons. And as he does, I'll sort of show a picture that goes along with it. He mentions gathering wild rice. So here's a picture of two people in a canoe who are sort of demonstrating that wild rice gathering. That's a taken at Moose River. Do you remember anything uh, more about what they said, what life was like? Were there lots of Indians that lived with them at Moose River? Yeah, there's quite a bit. We used to make rice there, Moose River. But now there, there's no right because the, the dam is at Kettle Falls. It, they control the water and uh, they flood the rice. I see. But when there's low water, then you get rice, see, all over. The Moose River, and then you get rice on Rainy Lake when the water's in the lower. High water, the rice never grows no place. Oh, a little bit, maybe, it's hardly sticking out of the water. There was a lot of rice, as you recall, when you were a young boy. There oh, was yeah, a lot yeah, there was rice all over. Yeah, we used to uh, save all that, you know, rice, blueberries, you know, we'd make racks, like fish racks, put gunny sacks on it, and then they put, put the blueberries on top of that. And we make long poles of wood that don't make no sparks, you know, just smoke. And the smoke will go through these sacks, and then the, and the blueberries will dry up. And after a while, they come like raisins. And we save them for winter and put them in sacks. It's just oh. like raisins, the blueberries. And we have them for winter time to eat. Gee, it's kind of like freeze drying them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. We, I uh, didn't we know tried that. everything, yeah. I didn't know that. Same with whitefish, you know. We'd save them, cut them open, and uh, put a stick to their tails, hang them up in the fall. That is for whitefish. We'd done that up there in Moose River. And How about sturgeon? Were there sturgeon in there? Sturgeon, the we, done, uh, we saved that too, everything like that. We had everything to eat like that, you know. So that's pretty nice, you know, one time. But Did you go out that. to get um, sugar maple, sugar? Maple sugar, yeah. we used to make that too, yeah. Where did you go and get uh, the syrup? All along there, uh, where we lived, there was maple trees there. Yeah, but do you know any of the names of the places? Because I don't know. Oh, I, I wouldn't know no the names. names. I was pretty young, see. That's yeah. a long time ago. If I went there now, 
I wouldn't know where, where, where the right spot, you know, because mm -hmm. that's a long time ago. But this maple tree... Okay, so with that, I think I have to stop, only because we've run out of time, but this is, of course, only a small fraction of the stories that the park has collected. It's even only small pieces of those stories. So, of course, these were one or two minute clips from hours of interviews. We, these are a few interviews from hundreds of interviews. And, of course, a hundred people does not even begin to come close to capturing all of the people who, over thousands of years, have called this place home, have traveled through this place, have visited, have moved and moved away. So, while we have these stories and they're incredibly valuable, there are, of course, so many more, each one would be different, and each one would add something rich to the historical record. So as I close, I want you, or I encourage you at least, to think a little bit more about some of those other voices, but that those that might have been missing or omitted or, or not captured, and those that you wish we might have moving forward. So one of the reasons I like to talk about oral histories is it is also something you could do at home. You can, there's really nice guides online to sort of getting started and capturing oral histories. I recommend the one from the Smithsonian is quite good. And then you can get started. You can use a phone. The International Falls Library actually has an oral history kit that comes with a recorder that you can check out. And so there are all different ways that you can start to capture your own memories, memories of people in your family, perhaps those who are a bit older, um, if you wanna make sure that you have their voice and have their memories. And as you do that, I encourage you to also think about what are the other voices that you want captured? What are the voices that together can create this environment that helps us better understand why places like Voyagers, why Voyagers, why the land Voyagers is on or the water Voyagers is on is important so we can continue to capture it, continue to talk about it, and continue to think about it, both with the people in the past and with the people who are creating those memories today. So with that, thank you so much. I hope to see some of you, if not at Voyagers, somewhere in the future. And thank you for attending this Notes from the Northwoods.